Um, warm welcome to everyone who's joining us from all over. Um, I see we have quite a few people from Singapore joining us, um, which is great. Uh, I'd just like to take a few minutes to introduce Dr. Owen Lee. Owen works currently at the University of Wollongong. Um, he is working in a range, well, I suppose you call yourself a social scientist, Owen? Yeah. Yep. Um, so Owen actually did his uh, PhD at JCU here in Australia in the Fish and Fisheries Lab. Um, so I guess he's lab alumni, um, but his PhD, I remember, was always interesting because he had have crazy stories to tell about some of the recreational fishing contacts that he was working with. Um, and um, yeah, you're now the recreational fishing executive for the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation in Australia. So um, we've asked Owen to come in and give us an overview about recreational fishing and how the landscape is changing, what that means for um, management, conservation, and um, yeah, how we understand and work with this very large sector of fisheries. So Owen, I'll bow out and leave it to you. Um, before we do that, if you have any questions throughout the um, uh, webinar, uh, please open the chat window and write your questions in there. I'll keep a, re a, um, a record of those questions and um, we'll circle back to that in question time. Okay, Owen, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so I can't see all of you, but thank you very much for logging in um, and joining me on my first uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, please bear with me since this is my first, we'll just have to muddle through this together. So this presentation is about recreational fishing in Australia in the 21st century. Um, now what I'm going to go through is obviously quite Australia specific, but a lot of these general trends are actually manifesting in other parts of the world also, um, particularly in the English speaking developed nations. Um, so we'll just crack on. So in Australia, um, really recreational fishing is more easily defined by what it isn't. Uh, and so it's not commercial, you can't sell your catch um, and it's not traditional indigenous activity. Um, and why it's easier to say um, what is not is because there are at least six separate motivations for doing it. Um, so I was part of a project a few years ago that looked at uncovering the motivations for recreational fishing among Australians. Um, and we found at least six um, discrete motivations, but they are not mutually exclusive. So there's mastery. Um, so that's about acquiring a new skill, getting good at it. Um, whatever that may be. Socialization, so this is, you know, hanging out with your friends, uh, doing something as a collective. Uh, escapism and relaxation, running off into the mountains and being alone. Um, the importance of catching large fish, and this is quite specific. So this is more your trophy hunters, I guess. Importance of catching something. Uh, so this is just actually succeeding at fishing. It doesn't matter to what level. Um, the importance of keeping a fish, um, obviously for food in this case. So given we're looking at that, we also need to ask ourselves, is it just a developed country thing? Um, so if you look at the two pictures on this slide, obviously there's a young girl and a boy walking down a creek um, and they're quite clearly from a, a wealthy European nation. Um, and then you look at the one just behind it and that's actually a picture of two e Kiribati kids. So I do a bit of work in, the, in Kiribati um, in the Pacific and they look to be doing exactly the same thing. Um, but you'll quite rarely see that called recreational fishing um, in the literature. Probably more likely someone would call it artisanal or um, subsistence. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, is it really just an arbitrary um, term that's based on the legislation and policy in an area? And Perhaps it is and perhaps it isn't. I think it really depends on scale. So who are recreational fishers? As I just stated, there's quite a few different motivations. So there's many different camps. Um, there are the hunter gatherers. Um, so people who really see fish as a food resource, 
Um, and quite often, actually, we find among those people, um, they find catch and release to be either irrelevant or un actually unethical, um, which is really interesting. Um, the escapists, so people who just want to go fishing and don't really care if they catch anything at all. Um, the casuals, and this is the huge majority of recreational fishers. The, these are people who keep some gear in the garage or in the back room and occasionally go once or twice a year when they're camping. Don't really mind if they catch anything, but it's good if they do. Uh, the trophy hunters, these are the people who tend to drop a huge amount of money um, into recreational fishing and have very specific gear and target species. Um, so, you know, as an example, your game fishers, people who deliberately target marlin and tuna, quite often just a handful of species. Um, the catch and release people, so not really interested in catching fish to eat them, um, more, more interested in just interacting with them, um, the experience itself and letting the fish go. Gearheads, um, sorry, I forgot I had photos. Um, so these are... Okay, catch and release. So gearheads, people who have a huge collection of fishing tackle, um, quite often a small mortgage is worth. Uh, and to them, that's an important part of the hobby. But um, like I said, they're not mutually exclusive and they're also not static in um, these categories. So people often behave differently depending on when, where, how, and what they are fishing for. So I've got a few species here as an example. So striped marlin here pictures. Um, most of the people who target striped marlin are in big boats, very expensive, use very expensive gear, spend a huge amount of money on fuel um, just for the hope of catching these things. And these days, mostly they just tag them and let them go. Um, in fact, our, the world's largest database of, um, of marlin movement is based on recreational fishing tagging programs. Um, so if Sam Williams is around watching, um, he would be able to tell you all about that. Um, here is a grunter. There are two species of those, but um, this one I think is Argentius. Um, anyway, um, for those of you who are from North Queensland or the North, in the tropics, uh, you'll probably recognize this fish. Um, it's mostly a food animal. So if you're targeting them, chances are you're going to catch Oh, sorry, you're going to keep and eat them. Um, less likely to catch and release, as an example. Uh, now, flathead is a really popular species in Australia. Um, this, this is a really interesting one because when they're oh, around that sort of 45 centimetre mark, people consider them food um, and they're quite highly prized for their food value. But more and more now, um, as you creep up towards the higher um, size, well, larger sizes of these, um, people are targeting them just to ogle them, take a photo and let them go. Um, and obviously in Queensland, there's a maximum size limit, but that, that's not actually true for at least New South Wales, I believe. Um, and even upwards of 60 centimetres when it's still legal, people are getting pressured into letting them go. Um, and this is partly because of an appreciation of their spawning capacity being larger animals. Um, but there's also a bit of a cultural change happening here. Uh, trout. Um, now, so these are really interesting because that's the same uh, for something that is the same animal and quite often in the same habitat, depending on when you catch them and what kind of gear you're using, um, you may be more or less likely to keep, um, keep or let them go. So there's a river in the Snowy Mountains here um, in Australia called the Threadbow. And during the, funnily enough, the spawning run of the brown trout, uh, huge congregations of recreational fishers will gather there. Um, and a lot of them are aiming to catch trout to keep them um, and eat them. They're not native here. Um, but if you go up there during a different time of year and you're up in the hill streams, um, you'll find probably a lot more people are tenderly handling these trout and letting them go to swim another day. And they're just there to watch them eat the fly and take a photo and let them go. Um, you know, New Zealand, uh, this happens a lot too. So Tongariro River, 
um, during the rainbow trout um, sporting runs, huge food motivation. You go up there any other time of year almost um, and suddenly people are being really gentle to them and letting them go. Uh, whiting is another species that's undergoing a bit of a shift in Australia. Um, historically, they've always been seen as food. Um, so people go and catch bags of them um, and they're quite good. Uh, but lately there's been a bit of a trend towards fishing for them with artificial lures. So not with bait. And when people do that, um, they still keep a lot of them to eat, but they're more likely to let them go also. So that, that's been very interesting to watch. Um, so before we move on to this, um, I guess, you know, the, the point I was trying to make is that recreational fishing has a diversity of motivations and it's really complex. People, um, act in all sorts of different ways, depending on what animal it is, when they're catching it, how they're catching it, um, why they're fishing for them. Um, and that difference also extends towards um, different cultural groups. Um, so I did some work a few years ago looking at Mandarin speaking recreational fishes in Australia. Um, and I, I was allowed to perform that research based on a few different reasons. Um, one being that unfortunately, um, Asian rock fishes are overrepresented among rock fishing fatalities um, in Australia. So if you're Asian you're, and a man, you're more likely to die on the rocks than someone who's not. Um, and there's also this localized perception um, in Australia, unfortunately, that uh, I guess Chinese speaking, recreational fishers are more likely to break the rules. Um, and so there was some compliance issues. Um, so, really a lot of these things needed to be validated. And there's a few other reasons why this research was important to conduct too. Um, and I've listed a few of them here. So Mandarin speakers are actually the largest non-English speaking group living in Australia and particularly in New South Wales. Um, the only, um, I guess, the only um, group um, ex that exceeds um, the number of Mandarin speaking migrants living in Australia are those from the UK, Channel Islands and Isle of Man. So they speak English. Um, they are also the largest proportion of proficient speakers of a non-English language living in Australia and New South Wales, um, it, but they are still a minority. So both of those percentages actually are roughly two and a half percent. Um, as I mentioned before, they're also quite often targeted and maligned for breaking fishing laws and regulations. Um, of course, there's no evidence to suggest whether that's a perceptual reality at this point. Um, so I investigated that in that study. And as I mentioned also, um, unfortunately, people with an Asian background are overrepresented among rock fishing fatalities. Um, during 2000 and 2007, they constituted 59%. Um, of those fatalities. Um, now, in Australia, at least, unfortunately, the current government um, approach or methods are a little bit insufficient. Um, they lump pretty much anyone who doesn't speak English into this group called CALD, which is culturally and linguistically diverse. And really, who on earth are we talking about here, right? Um, there's people from 288 different countries living in Australia and goodness knows how many language groups. Um, and quite often in material in, um, on government websites and particularly in the New South Wales DPI websites, the material that's in the other languages or the key other languages is two or three clicks away on an English website and quite often on a drop down menu and a little tiny PDF icon. So the likelihood of it being found by a non-English speaker or someone who's uncomfortable with English is quite low. Um, and look, I understand that non-English speaking people are a minority in Australia, but there's little to no engagement with language minorities um, on a, um, in terms of fisheries on a government level. So how did it, uh, our team reach Mandarin speaking recreational fishers. Uh, so we applied a technique that um, actually I borrowed from uh, some of the hospitals in the US um, when they're um, 
so they get toxic algal blooms, which can sometimes make shellfish um, unsafe for human consumption. And they found in a few of their neighborhoods, it was mostly Pacific Islanders and people of Asian origin who were more likely um, to be gleaning these shellfish and eating them. So they were in a high risk category, but of course, no one's um, required to note down their primary language um, or cultural background in a lot of those data sets. So how do you reach them in a hurry? Um, so literally they go, they go through their logs and they look for surnames um, and then door knock. So we didn't do the door knocking part, but I got uh, 10,165 um, recreational fishing license numbers. And then I looked for fishes with those, um, I guess, uh, top 100 most common surnames in China based on their census data um, at the time. And once those were spelled in English, um, that came down to a list of about 84. So we got 247 recreational fishes um, with a surname that was ch common in China. And we managed to get um, 42 of them interviewed, which is a 17% response rate. Uh, for those biologists out there, that might seem low, but actually in terms of surveys, that's pretty high as a response rate. Um, we also tried snowball sampling, um, but that didn't work, um, at least not well. So I thought I'd just put that here as a note for those who might be interested. Um, now, I think a major part of our success was because we employed um, Mandarin speakers as our interview words. Um, and Mandarin speakers with a solid understanding of Chinese culture. So that includes etiquette, how you address people, etc. cetera. Um, and that I think was really important. So, through our interviews, we, um, we found that, in fact, um, people who spoke Mandarin and had a strong, I guess, Chinese cultural influence um, were a little bit different in terms of their motivations. So they do value fish and seafood in different ways than the Anglo-Celt majority in Australia. Um, Michael Fabigny actually does some really fascinating work about um, how Chinese people in China value seafood. So the food harvested from the wild is regarded as cleaner health and healthier than something bought. So it, it's something held in really high regard. So if you share it with family, that's a sign of esteem. Um, they also often value species that the locals consider trash. So, you know, Chinese fishers quite often keep scorpion fish and wrasse. And what's really interesting is that while here they are considered trash and you rarely see them in a fish market, over in China and in Hong Kong, they're high ticket items. Um, they're also more likely to glean um, for food versus bait. So gleaning, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, is about walking onto a rock platform or on the sand flats and gathering shellfish. Um, so that might be clams, snails, little crabs, that sort of thing. Um, and it's, in Australia, that's usually done just to get bait. Um, that's certainly not the case around a lot of the rest of the world, actually. Um, but people of Asian extraction are more likely to glean for food. And sharing with a family is extremely important. Um, so that quite often drives, you know, why they might take home, you know, closer to a bay limit than, than one or two, as an example. All right, so in terms of communicating with Chinese people, um, you know, are they really that different? Um, and in some cases they are. So as an agency, so as a government agency, um, these are the messages that we thought were the most important to relay. Um, so, you know, Mandarin speaking, people tend to prefer to hear messages from one of their own. That doesn't mean want someone in their family or even necessarily their um, close knit social group. Um, that just means someone else who's clearly Mandarin speaking um, and has some idea of um, Chinese culture. Um, and when relaying messages, um, it's really important to make sure that uh, the audience can maintain face. So something that might come across as being patronizing um, or implying that the audience is, you know, 
um, ignorant, I guess, uh, is not going to work, um, especially if you're targeting older men who in Chinese culture, uh, you know, are in a position of, I guess, um, well, they're considered a, an authority in, or a knowledge authority or knowledge resource. Um, so they're used to being in a, in a place of esteem. Um, so related to that, messaging from someone who's clearly very young um, is probably going to be less likely to be successful, especially if it is aimed at those older people. Um, they also use different social media platforms. Now, those of you from overseas um, probably realize this already. Um, and those of you with friends from China already know this already, but um, a lot of people don't. And that is, you know, because Facebook um, is not accessible in China, um, they have their own social media platforms and they continue to use those when they're here. So we suggested um, they engage through WeChat, um, which is the one that they use most. Um, now, from within their community, so within the Chinese-speaking, culturally Chinese communities, um, they, they also behave slightly differently. So they tend to be deferential towards elders. Um, and this can also actually extend to the point where they know that the elder is saying something incorrect, but they won't go out of their way to correct that elder because the, the respect that they convey is more important than, than correcting them in this instance. Um, the elders are also unlikely to ask for advice or assistance, even when it comes to translation. So quite often the older migrants uh, are less um, comfortable with English, but they're less likely to go out of their way to ask, you know, their grandchild as an example, to help them navigate through a website because that conveys a level of ignorance. Are they compliant? Well, Yes, actually, for the most part. So I, I looked through many years of compliance data and um, did a, a similar surname um, search and applied the same lens there. Um, and for most years, they rarely exceeded 2% of um, the offences recorded. Um, now, of course, that's assuming that there's not some sort of um, effect here, right? That... Um, for some peculiar reason, Mandarin fishes are either a smaller or larger proportion of the recreational fishing population than they are a population in the state or the country. Um, however, in the last few years, that seems to have crept up a bit. And that could be for a few reasons, um, none of which I could get confirmation of. So one of those reasons might be that actually it was the compliance officers getting called out to or deliberately looking for um, a you know people of asian extraction um there's a few uh activities that they tend to do in groups so they're kind of conspicuous right so gleaning as an example um they tend to do in groups um there's a, a fishery here in new south wales for hair tail which they tend to do in groups um so if you're targeting those areas um and people who tend to fish in groups you're probably more likely to to catch them doing the wrong thing if they do in fact decide to do the wrong thing so that that this one's a really hard one to actually answer categorically but after you know all that really um chinese speaking people are still people um word of mouth is still the most important information source uh, regarding fishing safety um fishing itself fisheries management and regulations um they don't like being singled out and they respond negatively to that uh, they don't like being told that they're wrong. Um, they like information to be convenient, uh, as in where they'd expect to see it. So quite often they've asked for clearer and better signage about uh, fishing regulations at the venue. Um, they're unlikely to stray from their comfort zone. So expecting them to go through a website that they don't find relevant or interesting to look for government documentation is probably not going to meet with great success. And messaging is best if it is brief and uses imagery more than words. So, you know, that, that's just one cultural group there. Um, but there are other groups in, in Australia too um, that probably aren't engaged suitably in fisheries management in Australia. Um, and as I'm hoping I've given you an impression of, recreational fishers aren't recreational fishes as an umbrella thing we're not one thing um 
and as an example, uh, there are definitely non-Indigenous subsistence fishes in Australia, um, but they are not managed that way. So any of you guys who do boat ramp surveys up, up north, you, you guys notice the, the grey nomads. They, they come up um, every winter around this time of year and they mostly operate as, as a subsistence or artisanal fleet. They fish to feed themselves as, as they enjoy the weather. Um, here, here we see um, a photo of a fishery that's quite common in the, I guess, southeastern corner of Australia um, for this thing called Ludric. Um, that break wall is just covered in people targeting Ludric. And the gear looks like it was from 100 years ago. And actually, if you use gear from 100 years ago, it would look and function the same. Um, this sort of gear became popular I guess it was adapted from English river fishing, um, but you know, post depression, uh, a lot of people needed to fish to feed their family. And this fishery became popular because of that um, and continues to be popular to this day um, and fished in exactly the same way. Ludric are not typically caught and released. People catch them to eat them and they enjoy catching large numbers of them to eat them um, because it's part of the culture. <laughs> So really subsistence fishing is, is not, um, I guess, the sole preserve of developing countries or foreign countries. Actually, it occurs here too. Um, I think it's also important to point out that recreational fishing media and, and the industry that supplies gear and tackle, et cetera, is not necessarily representative of the community as a whole. Um, so on the left here, you see some snapshots of like people in a, in a fishing competition. Quite often this will involve expensive gear and boats, um, catch and release and, you know, high end clothing, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite glamorous if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and there's a game fishing boat there. It's not unusual for these outfits to run over a million dollars. Um, and then at the bottom left there, you have um, Japanese style of rock fishing, which involves high-end gear, um, really nice um, equipment, um, and including the safety gear, et cetera, et cetera. But really, if you look on the right there, that's probably more what people's experience of recreational fishers in general, especially in Australia, is going to be. Um, it's people in whatever they had lying around in the garage, um, you know, mid-range gear, low-end gear, but it functions. Um, quite often hanging around in, in groups, um, catching fairly humble animals or not catching much at all. Um, that, that's probably more typical. So really, you know, recreational, the recreational fishing sector or community differs in terms of demographics, their values, their conduct, their perceptions. Is it even a single sector or community? And I think at this point we really need to drill down into the fact that it can be but it's a matter of scale so if you're interested in a specific fishery um, then perhaps you could treat them as a single sector or community but you need to be cogent of the fact that you are in fact surveying a subsection of the community um, you're not looking at how every recreational fisher thinks about grunter as an example um, now to this end I guess the question becomes to people with an interest in fisheries management well what do we do about that um, and what's really interesting in Australia is that actually a few of the state agencies before un this unfortunate pandemic began were looking at adapting their fisheries management um, for that diversity and for that really distinct difference um, between recreational fishing and commercial fishing um, because commercial fishing models are largely based around biomass um, and biological stocks and that profit that it reflects or the, val the monetary value that it reflects. Um, clearly in Australia, that's not possible for recreational fishing um, because recreational catch is really hard to quantify. Um, there's a lot of people doing it at random times. State agencies are under-resourced and it's really hard to get a good estimate. Um, and more importantly, we're, because recreational fishers are not allowed to sell anything, they're actually technically insolvent. Um, and because not all recreational fishers want to 
keep the fish and take them home. You can't even do a, a money proxy for, for the weight of fish. Um, that's not necessarily appropriate. So here, in, here rolls this concept called maximum experiential yield. Now, Frank, I can't see if you're there, but uh, for those who are listening, uh, Frank Prokop came up with this idea a few years back um, and it's gaining some momentum. So this is about managing fisheries according to maximum experiential yield as opposed to maximum economic or sustainable yield. So really it's about what can this fishery provide a community in terms of mental health benefit, in terms of food value, et cetera, et cetera, um, and managing the fishery that way. Okay. So um, it was gaining traction. New South Wales was tr working towards it. Um, Northern Territory was working towards it, um, but it was challenging, um, of course, because the different species, different times, etc. That means the experience or that you're looking at might be different, and it will probably change with time. So any, um, I guess, harvest strategy proxy that you employ using a maximum experiential yield will need to be regularly recalibrated. So now th this whole presentation is about um, how recreational fishing, or at least our understanding of recreational fishing is, should be a little bit more nuanced, I think, than it, it has been in the past. Um, but these last two years have, have seen some, re oh, sorry, these last two decades have seen some really huge changes. Um, and I'll just roll through a few of them. Um, now, if we talk to people in, I guess, fisheries management, um, and you talk to scientists in, who are familiar with primary lit literature, et cetera, these frictions tend to pop up a lot. So it's the commercial sector versus the recreational sector, um, the fishers versus the government, the fishers versus greenies, um, the locals versus others. You know, so here we have um, some, well, a whole bunch of recreational fishers protesting the super trawler, which was a huge commercial fishing vessel um, that was going to operate in Australia. You know, here is a um, another protest um, with recreational fishers against uh, New South Wales marine parks. Um, you know, here is Peter. Um, you know, who clearly don't like recreational fishing, um, trying to tell people that fish pain is equivalent to human pain. Um, you know, and these local groups uh, are starting to, I guess, become more common because it's easier for people to mobilize via social media um, than it was in the past. Um, but so this, this is a local example here. Um, in Lake Illawarra, a group of people decided that um, they didn't like the fact that people were gleaning for cockles on the foreshore. Um, and now some of these concerns were legitimate. Um, people were caught poaching, but it got to the point where actually the locals were reporting poaching um, so often that um, they, they drew all of the enforcement officers from New South Wales to this lake over a busy summer period. Um, and actually upwards, I think of 80% of the people or 85% of the people um, who the inspectors approached were doing the right thing. Um, it's just that unfortunately for the, you know, for these circumstances, they were Asian and they were gleaning. Um, and, I've had someone actually bring their dog down and harass me over it before, and I wasn't gleaning. Um, so how have th things changed? Well, the commercial versus recreational divide is breaking down in, in a few fisheries at least, um, which is nice to see. Uh, there's a realization that it is a shared resource and both really want healthy habitats and fish stocks. That's essentially what they both want. So that, they're happy enough to work towards a common goal in that sense. It is better in some states than others, um, you know, and some fisheries than others. So beach hauling is a pretty controversial fishery in, in Queensland um, and New South Wales. Uh, recreational fishers tend to frown upon that. Um, but, you know, if we're talking about some of the more targeted um, professional fisheries or commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries by and large don't seem to mind them as much. 
Um, it is still a fragile relationship though. So the moment a resource looks like it might be stressed, um, you know, people tend to quickly find their sides again. You know, fishers versus government. Um, now there's an increased realization from most of the fisheries management agencies in Australia that top down centralized government governance does not work on a highly diffuse, um, essentially ununited sector that operates at random times. Um, and, you know, for quite a few of the states in Australia, it doesn't even have a sampling, oh, sorry, a licensing frame or requirement. Um, so you don't know who they are, they, you don't know when they're going to operate, you don't have enough people to police everything. Um, so top down doesn't work. Um, so the, that's why a lot of the state agencies are now working a lot more with recreational fishers. Um, so they'll engage with them to do things that they feel are beneficial to both parties. Um, and in line with that, is that adjustment to harvest strategies that I was talking about earlier. Um, they're working towards a model of fisheries management that is more appropriate for recreational fishing and not just an adaptation of commercial fisheries management. That too is a fragile relationship, but it is, it is moving in the right direction. The fishers versus greenies thing. Um, so this too, like really interesting developments over the last few years. Um, so we realized both want healthy habitats. Um, and that it's not just about putting more fish in the water for you to catch later. Um, and sometimes actually fishers do more for habitat than greenies. Um, although that's not obviously mutually exclusive. I'm just going to switch my screens for a minute and, and show you a video of this uh, group called Ozfish Unlimited. Now, please bear in mind that everyone, almost everyone in this video is a recreational fisher and they're almost all volunteers. So, this, um, for those of you who aren't from Australia, um, is about, uh, well, the drought ravaged rivers in Australia. So for many years, we've been experiencing some really significant drought. A lot of the major rivers have actually dried up um, or did dry up. Um, and this is about these guys getting together to try and rescue these native fish, which they really care about. Um, and they're essentially in stagnant muddy pools, um, which is all that remains of those rivers. On um, now, this is a sad, unfortunate um, circumstance of the recreational fishing industry and the way it's been, I guess, promoted historically. Um, and it was, well, I mean, there's, let's put it bluntly, it was pretty sexist um, back in the day. Uh, thankfully, that's starting to change. Um, so you can see, you know, these two covers from the same publication. Um, one was from a few years ago, um, you know, probably not usual fishing attire um, for a person. Um, and judging from the way she's holding that fish, she's probably not terribly familiar about fishing in general. Um, she's just been put there to hold the fish to get the magazine sales. Um, and, you know, now we have a competition winning Barramundi fisher um, on, the, on the cover um, who is a woman. Um, now, this really interesting phenomenon sort of happened in the last few years, and that is that um, we're starting to see women's fishing groups uh, gain momentum in Australia. So this is one that was started by the Victorian Fisheries Authority uh, called Women in Recreational Fishing. And it is all about breaking down the barriers and building capacity among women. A lot of women reached out and they said, I want to go fishing, um, but um, people are really patronizing to me, uh, won't give me the time of the day, um, or insulting. Um, I don't want anything to do with that. Can you help me out? Um, and this network of women is sort of built up. Um, I've become aware of some other groups actually around the country. I believe there's one in Northern Territory as well um, that wasn't started by the government, um, just by a bunch of women who wanted to help other women get into fishing. Okay. Um, as a, as a sector, as a whole, um, we've become a little bit more environmentally focused, I think. Um, and I guess generally more giving um, and less expectation of the government, right? Um, so a lot of 
recreational fisher volunteers are doing habitat restoration and improvement. Here we've got um, Matt Barwick and David Chirovolo, and I think that's Matt Barwick's partner. Um, Ozfish Unlimited in Northern Territory, pulling shopping trolleys and rubbish out of literally crocodile filled mangrove swamps. Um, there's a bunch of recreational fishers in that uh, below photo who are working on the shellfish restoration projects around the country. And that's a habitat that Australia has lost 90 ish percent of. Um, but you know, they're putting in their time and their effort to do that. Um, we're seeing a lot more community events, um, biosecurity monitoring, um, especially following the white spot virus in Queensland. Our tagging programs have always been very prominently supported by recreational fishers, especially the game fish. Um, Sample collection for science and management. Um, so long-term monitoring program in Queensland, um, a lot of the Mulloway research, et cetera, et cetera, that's rec supported or recreational fisher supported. Um, and now actually we're starting to move into to the development of more environmentally friendly technologies. So as the executive officer of recreational fishing research, we just got a couple of applications to develop um, bait bags that biodegrade in a marine environment, not a terrestrial one. Um, so hopefully something comes of that. And the world is changing faster now than it, it, it really ever has. I mean, the digital re revolution is incredible. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't unusual to find someone with a dial phone in their home. Um, and then there was the, you know, the handheld mobile revolution. And now we all have a little black piece of glass that allows us to access every bit of information in the world. Um, climate change obviously is significant. Um, you know, range extension is happening a lot in Australia. A lot of species have begun to move. Um, so in Tasmania, they're now seeing kingfish and snapper, which will wind up providing management challenges. Um, Ocean currents are also changing with temperatures. So some fish are just not coming close and other fish are coming close when they really hadn't before. Um, there's been quite a lot of dolphin fish caught in Victoria as an example, which for those guys from outside Australia, long way south. Um, unfortunately, this pandemic um, has changed the way fishing is being conducted, obviously, or not in this case. Um, many fishers are choosing to stay at home and many not. Um, it's creating a lot of frictions actually in the community, which has been interesting, but also sad to see. Um, and this is a possibility actually that um, in Australia, at least we might see a shift back towards food motivations as more people lose their jobs and supply chains continue to recover, especially in regional areas. Um, and then of course that begs the question, it's like, isn't that subsistence fishing at that point in time? It's probably not so recreational anymore. Um, now, in keeping with the rapid pace of change in the world, um, we have a project going on at the moment that will hopefully help us keep abreast of that. Um, so there's the National Recreational Fishing Survey, which we put a huge amount of effort and money into. Um, and it's a, about developing a way that we can continue to survey the recreational fishing community more frequently than we have been. So historically, it's been like every 10 years um, or more. Um, there's an online modality, so things can happen quickly and cheaply. Um, and it, we're updating and recalibrating sampling frames. So, you know, historically people used a phone book to reach recreational fishers. Clearly that's not appropriate anymore. And in fact, we're finding telephone surveys to be quite skewed these days too. So this is looking at, you know, developing a new sampling frame, but also comparing it with the old ones to see, you know, what the differences are so we can actually make a stronger and better estimate. Um, and it will give us, you know, a more recent snapshot and also continuing snapshots of what the community actually is, what they want and how that community values recreational fishing, benefits from it, um, what they spend on fishing and also how they might be prevented from fishing. Um, in terms of the future, uh, I mean, we're seeing more environmental stewardship and responsibility and I hope that continues to grow. Um, we're seeing more, I guess, um, realization and recognition of animal welfare um, and trying to look after these animals that we fish for, um, both if we decide to keep them and if we don't. Um, capacity development. So within the sector itself, we're looking at 
getting better at building leadership um, and integrating into fisheries management. Um, also helping fisheries management agencies um, inc improve their capacity to engage with recreational fishers and get successful outcomes. Um, you know, we're looking at maximizing the experiential value from fisheries. So take becomes less important, or at least it becomes less of the focus. Um, and really what we want is longevity of recreational fishing as, as a sector. Um, you know, no one wants to see their lifestyle activity stopped. Um, might come, but we'd prefer it didn't. Um, and keep, so we can keep doing it. Um, and also to keep track of recreational fishing. And part of that is a responsibility also. Um, we need to keep an eye on our sector and, you know, see if things are changing for the better or for the worse. Okay. Um, and I guess from here on, I mean, given the pandemic and everything else that's happening in the world, it's hard to say with any certainty what's going to happen. Um, so I guess that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Owen. I'm sure there's lots of virtual wrapping on tables and random bits of applause. Um, <laughs> we've had some good questions come through. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you can stop sharing your screen. Oh no, wait, that's my screen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so uh, someone has asked, circling back to your point uh, about recreational fishing being predominantly a developed country, a developed mm -hmm. country thing. Um, have you are you aware of any research in Asia and the Southeast Asian region of how recreational fishing is developing over there? And would you expect mm. that there would be different recreational fisher profiles that are quite different from developed countries like Australia? Um, so I would say I haven't been aware of any. Having said that, I can only read English primary literature. <laughs> so really it's, it's a, I, I can't categorically say there hasn't. Um, I mean, China's actually had a history, a like really long history of recreational fishing or, or meditative fishing. Um, and that's, that's documented in cultural studies, but whether anyone's actually looked at that in a contemporary sense, um, I can't tell you. Um, Japan has a massive recreational fishing industry. Um, and I would only assume that they've done some research in it, but I can't read Japanese primary literature. So it's a possibility it's there. Um, as for the second half of the question, I would probably expect um, recreational fish profiles to be quite different in um, from developed countries like Australia um, in, in other countries. Um, I would imagine those motivations would be different in terms of proportion, um, depending on the cultural um, lens that's applied over it. So, you know, if we were in, Oh, let's use a, an example I'm familiar with in, in Hong Kong, which is where my family's from. Um, the food motivation would probably be quite high uh, for a lot of animals. Um, the trophy hunting less so uh, just doesn't really happen very much. Catch and release also doesn't happen very much. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, I certainly would imagine there would be differences. Yep. All right. Um, uh, another question um, is edging, which is uh, squid jigging. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, it's very popular. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and look, it was, it was, um, it got pretty big um, in the Southern, Southern parts of the, the country um, a few years ago. Uh, it's sort of lost a little bit of momentum now, but I think that's just, you know, initial hype and then it dies down a little bit. Um, but definitely it's popular. I do it. Um, I don't use a $500 reel and $1,000 rod to do it. Um, but I definitely like my Yamashita jigs. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so here's another question. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about they're not recreational fish is not responding very well to uh, top-down government. Yeah. Um, would you care, could you talk about polycentric governance models and maybe how that could be used to um, manage the fishery where you have those drivers coming from multiple sectors? Mm. So I think that happens fairly informally in Australia. Um, so you get 
you know, with any human behavior, it's governed by social norms um, as well as your own values, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if your community or the ones close to you have a particular set of values that will impose itself upon your behavior, um, whether you like to or not, or, or it will become a part of your decision to behave accordingly or not. Um, I think that definitely happens in Australia and it's probably responsible for a lot of those strange little differences you, you, you saw early on in the presentation where it's like, it's the same animal, but depending on how old it is and how big it is, people behave differently. And that's not based on objectivity necessarily. That's based on social pressure a lot of the time. So as an example, um, with those big flathead, um, yes, there's a maximum size limit. Um, but look, 30, 40 years ago, they were food. Um, and people wanted them as food. So you, you got people quite proudly taking them home to eat them. Um, now, if you did that, you'd probably get lynched. Um, yeah, or at least you'd cop so much um, hate from, from like if you posted up a photo of you cutting up a giant flathead, um, you, you would absolutely cop it. And that's not necessarily because it's a legal implication. It's because the community around you um, is imposing their values upon you. So, yeah, I, I, I believe that would happen. I just don't think it's a formal situation in Australia yet. We're not organized enough to do it, really, to be mm. honest. All right. So I think we've got one last question. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from Sue at Marine Stewards in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, Singapore is just, I guess, getting to grips with developing management for um, recreational fishing okay. and only just begun to introduce guidelines. Um, so the question is, what do you think are some ways uh, that can be done to sustain change and ingrain sustainable fishing habits in what is essentially a first generation of recreational fishers mm. that are exposed to fishing rules. Yeah. So I would say, and this, this actually applies to Australia also in the sense that, you know, we don't really have um, inf enough enforcement officers to do this, um, to do it the top down way, the traditional way. And the best way to ensure that um, I guess, a huge community behaves accordingly and also keeps behaving accordingly is to give them ownership over those regulations. So I would say the Singaporean government needs to engage very closely with those recreational fishers out there and either explain why they feel a certain regulation is necessary, but or, or have a bit of give and take. It's like, what do they think is important for them? Um, quite often you might actually find the recreational fishers to be more conservative than your biological model suggests you need to be. So in Australia, that happens. Um, people get, have self-imposed minimum sizes that are much larger than the legal minimum sizes. And it's purely because they don't see the point in killing something so small, um, you know, or they see the value in allowing the smaller thing to get big so they can enjoy it more yeah. later. Yeah. Um, that absolutely happens. And so that, that ownership allows things to become the social norm. And if you can get your, your regulations rooted in sustainability to become the social norm, suddenly the whole system's a lot stronger. So that, yeah. that's what I would suggest. All right. Okay. Well, um, I think we are fast approaching the time when uh, the webinar will cut off. Mm -hmm. So we might leave it things there. Thanks everyone for uh, coming along and spending your time uh, today. And Owen, thanks again for uh, um, coming along and uh, yeah, giving us an update on how much recreational fishing is changing and what this means for us who are trying to understand, study it and um, uh, help provide guidance for sustainable management. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Owen. And Thank you. Um, I hope everyone has a good week.